Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the first episode of Breakout Weekly. I am your host, Tony Savo, and I'm joined by the lovely Monique. Hello, everybody. I'm Monique Dismuke, and thank you for joining us. And we also have our lovely panelists out in the audience, Lisa. Hello. Lisa. Hey, Tony. Hey, Monique. Nice Hello. to see you. Good to see great you. to be here. Awesome. We're also joined to, by some great uh, talent here today. We have with us Jay, Jason New, who's a filmmaker. Um, we also have Shay. Uh, our, our Betty. Our Betty, sorry, I'm uh, horrible at pronunciation. And we also have Sonny B. Allen, who's an independent author and a book writer. Yes. Jason, why don't you go ahead and give us some information, your background on your film um, company and what you do. Sure, so my name is Jason and um, I studied film in school and then from there um, got hired at full time in the production place, but then um, it wasn't a great outlet for artistic endeavors, so um, the best way to do it is pursue it on your own, so independent filmmaking. So that's where um, I started doing different music videos, entered different contests, and um, joined other people's production. And the goal was just to create independent film with diverse content, so things that you don't normally see in like Hollywood or traditional settings, um, something that you could do. Um, with different perspectives, so some things that we can do um, in our own way. So that's my approach, and then been doing that since I, 2006 or so, and then continuing on. Nice. Yeah. And what would be an example of what you're working on right now that could give us an idea of what you work with? Sure. I like telling stories, and the best way to do it in a really affordable way now is short stories. So they're, and a lot of them are comedies, and they're set up, um, they're set up like a joke. So you, you set it up, and then there's a punchline, so then it ends the short. But then it's a really fun story to do, um, because it, it, it shows the character development, start, you know, it has a beginning and end, middle end, and um, it's just, it's, it's fun to craft a story and tell it, and have um, other people that are part of it, and people that just, not, not even a part of it, um, just watch it and also enjoy the things you create. Nice. Now, Jason, walk us through the creative process. When you decide to take on a project, yes. uh, you're looking at a script, mm -hmm. right? Um, you start thinking about you know, how to tackle the project. How does, how does that work out in real time? Well, it, it probably takes a month um, time-wise just because um, you really want to be prepared when you take on a project because mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot of other people's time which you start production. Mm -hmm. So when you have the script, um, you just want to make sure you have, um, it, it's practical, like you can get the locations you need, you mm -hmm. can break down the shots, so um, you're not going to spend too much time on setups. Because every time you have uh, a lot of setups, you're gonna spend a lot of time uh, making it look good. So the lighting, the sound isn't in the way, and then just um, positioning. So the less, um, the more prepared you are in doing those things, the less time you will have to um, spend on doing those. Operation. Yeah, exactly. So then, um, yeah, once you get on set, you just start executing, um, and then and then the workflow really it's about. Um, I mean, a lot of that prep comes in again, so it's the storyboard, the shot list. So if you have all those things prepared, and then you uh, work off of that, you, you have a lot uh, success. But some things, I mean, it is difficult sometimes because things get in a way that you might not um, you well, expect it. Yeah, oh, exactly. Gotcha. So then um, you just, you know, you, you be flexible too, so you can work with those things. Awesome. Yeah. And I just wanted to know, what type of uh, clientele or diversity in your clientele do you usually work with? Sure. Um, I've um, so a lot of different uh, independent filmmakers or artists. They don't always have. It's not. It's a lot of work to do a feature or a production, just because of the coordination and maybe. I mean, you got the equipment, you got the talent, you got the crew. There's a lot you got to put together. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of times, it's people that want to do. They also they're artists and they also want to tell stories. They just don't really have a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So the best way, really, is just to, um, you know, so if I put something out there, someone else may see it and be like, oh, I want to do it. Then it's like, oh, well, what's stopping you? It's like, well, I don't have equipment and stuff. Well, let me help you. So then a conversation starts after you kind of created something. And then, and then it kind of like a trickle effect in a way, too, because they'll bring in people they know. And then um, they'll learn stuff. And then we'll work. We'll all kind of like crew on each other's projects. It kind of builds your network. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you have you have a collective uh, That's right. of artists that you're associated with, right? Yeah, my group is called Revocade Entertainment, and then um, there's some of them are here in the audience, and they uh, we yeah, yeah a lot of us got together yeah a lot of us got together um, 
Because in the Bay Area, it's it's not a big film place. Like you know, you, when you talk about film, you talk about LA most likely. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you have to be in LA to make film. You could be almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I think what it really takes is the the motivation to do it. And then when you have a strong network, then you really those possibilities really become more um, available. So mm -hmm. once you connect with like-minded folks and people with different skills, then you have a really strong project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's take it to uh, Lisa, our guest panelist. Lisa, was there any uh, questions there that uh, anyone in the audience had? Uh, yeah, you know, Jason, I'd love to hear a little bit about this film festival that I know you've been involved and produced yeah. with. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. it's So I volunteer with the Center for Asian American Media, and then they do the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival every year. But now it's since changed to CamFest. <laughs> so then um, I work with, I review their shorts, so I'm part of their short screening committee. So what I do is um, everyone that submits to the film festival um, has to get reviewed by a committee. And then I'm, I was a part of the reviewing process. So um, after films get submitted, I would uh, watch hundreds and then um, just review them and critique them and then submit it to the curators and then they'll review those notes because they can't possibly watch them all. So mm -hmm. then they need something to work off of and then mm -hmm. move on from there. And then uh, programming-wise, um, once they once they pass me, they'll move on to another committee um, that also reviews it, and then they'll go on to curators, and then they'll create a program around it. And then um, shorts are one of the more accessible points for independent filmmakers when they uh, submit to film festivals because um, it's a lot more flexible <coughs> um, and and. Kind of what they look for too is like a theme, so then they can put a program together. So when um, uh, and it helps film festivals a lot because a lot of people might want to watch different like kind of shorts. So there's like romantic, there's like dramatic, there's comedy, there's animation. Exactly. Yeah, right. So if you if you have a type of film at all, then you submit. Then it's um, a definitely a good avenue for for filmmakers. Nice. Great. And uh, where can the public catch the next Cam Fest? The Camp Fest will be in San Francisco every year. It's around March, the second week of March, um, around the 13th uh, to about the 20th. And then um, they play all over San Francisco. Uh, Castro Theater for the opening weekend. Um, Japantown Kabuki for most of the um, duration of it, but also in uh, BFA, actually, uh, PFA, uh, Pacific Film Archive. Okay, that yeah, sounds nice. great. Well, um, I would love to find out from our audience, and I, I know some of the filmmakers you work with are with us in our audience. Uh, do we have one maybe over here? Can you tell us your name? Uh, my name is Grant Inaba. Okay, Grant, can you tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done with Jason's collective? Um, Jason, we kind of leave up to uh, the filmmaker uh, part of it. He's got a lot of great ideas and a lot of projects. Uh, mm -hmm. They turn into really great films. Uh, I kind of handle a lot of the, um, I don't know, promotional, uh, marketing, social media type stuff. Great um, job there This too. is Daniel here, mm -hmm. and he uh, is a cinematographer. He does a lot of the, uh, shoots a lot of the films. Hey, and Veronica, who's a very talented um, uh, wardrobe and, uh, uh, and also an uh, actor as well. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about your work with Jason. Um, so I guess I've actually known Jason from college. Um, so we were both film majors together. And so one of the first things when we kind of graduated um, was a, a kind of a 72 hour shootout um, competition. And so like kind of that we all really enjoyed it. And that kind of really spawned, I think, when, you know, kind of the beginning of our video group. That's terrific. Um, any questions or comments from anyone else in our audience who has any thoughts? Oh, oh, we do have a question. Hang on. And can you, can you hold on. Let me let me just get the mic over here. <laughs> can you yeah. speak to what some of the popular trends are in uh, independent filmmaking? Popular today? trends, yeah. A lot of people uh, like technology a lot. So um, the RED camera is um, a very high-end HD camera. So a lot of people, when they work on different projects, that's like their, the first thing they go to. So that's an equipment trend. Um, Another equipment trend is um, DSLRs. So there's just um, cameras, like regular uh, shooting cameras, but they do video now in HD. So a lot of people are utilizing those because they're more mobile and um, interchangeable lens or depth of field. Um, visual stories and things like that, I think there's, 
there's a joke in film school. There's always in in the student project or independent project. There's always uh, blood or death. There's you know. There's <laughs> so yeah. So I mean, I I try not to do things like that very very purposefully because I think there's a lot of stories to tell and a lot of those come from yourself and Hollywood doesn't always reflect people that um, that that are watching so it, it takes the community that okay. that has that artistic ability or or uh, ability in general just you know equipment access to equipment things like that to to craft those stories and put them out there which helps to change some of the images exactly and bring these things oh, yeah. to light because uh -huh. There's so much diversity and so much talent, and it, it does need to be brought to the That's, forefront. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Thanks. Great, great. Okay. I do believe we have a, a clip from one of your movies that oh, yeah. we can show, so yeah. we're going to run that and okay. take a look. Sounds good. All right. something I do. Well, not what I expected. Are you sure?
So, Jason, this time of the show, we'd like to give you a chance to uh, shout out uh, okay. any, anybody that you work with or, or plug. Uh, where can people find your content? What's the website, the YouTube? Sure. Okay, so yeah, we have a website. It's www.revocate.com. And Revocate is um, just the way it sounds, R-E-V-E-L-C-A-D-E. -E. And then there it has the, all the external links to everything, our 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 Vimeo, our Facebook, our IMDB, our YouTube. So it has um, everything you want to know about us, um, artist profile and things were um, upcoming and things like that. Um, we worked though, with a lot of different community members too. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people, um, some people are minor race media, granny cart gangstas, mm -hmm. and then, uh, <laughs> and then um, yeah, well, uh, what is it? I don't care films. He's a, a filmmaker doing um, a feature. Okay. And then um, our current logo is by someone named Samantha Sam. She's um, uh, a, a, a graphic designer. And then like we, that's, that's a tough part about filmmaking sometimes. Like you want to market yourself, but you don't have a, like some peripheral oh, things, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, sure. So then you, you know, then you, then you meet other people. And then they have skills. Everyone has a role. Exactly. So I think I think it kind of takes that initiative to to want to do something and then do it and then other people kind of gravitate towards that too. Right. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And we're very also we're joined uh, today by another filmmaker um, from the San Francisco Bay Area here, Shay. Um, go ahead and tell us about yourself and, uh, and what do you do exactly? Yeah, um, my name is uh, Shay Arvedi. I'm a writer, director. Um, just pretty much uh, finished a uh, grad program at the Berkeley Digital Film Institute. Nice. So I've um, been working on a web series for about three years, um, writing it, um, and just pretty much preparing that. So nice, that's exciting. And so, what does the web series entail? What is it? Uh, what is the it web about? series, the title of the series is it's called the Millennials, um, and it's a sci-fi kind of spy mix-up. Um, I say it'd be a cross between like a show like Lost or The Twilight Zone. Um, it follows a group of art students who discover conspiracy to lower the world's human population mm. and they're trying to figure out what to do to stop it. So um, we plan to uh, release like a graphic novel because I've been, I've been writing like a lot and you know the thing kind of what you were hitting on man is, is really expensive mm -hmm. and the things that you write you always have to kind of, you know you're, you're writing with your producer hat on, can I afford this, are we going to be able to pull this off, so there's a lot of stuff that we weren't really going to be able to pull off for the web series portion, but we could illustrate it and make a comic book out of it. So we'll be doing mm -hmm. a lot of the extra story, um, and the storylines we couldn't really do in the web series. We'll make a, a graphic. So graphic it allows you to for take it. it in different avenues. Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's cool. Now that's that's a important, uh, really interesting point you bring up. Is I notice a lot of there's a correlation between uh, a lot of directors being comic book fans. Uh, would you say? Uh, would you, <laughs> I think so. I think there's a good quadrant of. Um, uh, not even just directors, uh, DPs, a lot of people just in filmmaking that um, they have a lot of, you know, affinity for that, that style of writing, that style of storytelling. I think it's really comparable to, to filmmaking and its presentation. Because um, it's, you know, it's, uh, comic books are exciting. It's completely different than reading a novel or something like that. So Also, you um, have the storybo storyboard of course, aspect. You of always it, right? have the, the yeah. visual um, component to it, which it plays just like a storyboard. So if you're, if you're you know, familiar with telling a story that way, is, that's definitely something that you would be interested in, so. And can I just ask what inspired you to get into this business? Like, how did this happen Um, oh, man, my mom took me to Universal Studios when I was like, <laughs> and okay. uh, there was like a, uh, I remember uh, Waterworld with Kevin Costner had just came out, um, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, it was like a huge hit, and they had like this exhibit there which basically, um, it showed all the extra components, the production design, the set design, the wardrobe, all the kind of stuff that you don't always associate with film. Right. And it was just like, you know, it just to be able to you. see that part of it and how it was really like an art form and it wasn't just this thing that happened to see, you know, there's people, there this is what they process. do, this is every, you know, this is people's jobs. Right. That was just really, really, that was dealt to me. Yeah. I was always something that I was interested in trying to get into, so. So we asked Jason, um, we'll pose a question to you. When you're starting the creative process, how does that, is that something that just happens organically? Do you, do people um, solicit ideas to you now that you've kind of got a reputation for being a, an indie filmmaker or how, how does that um, come together? I mean, like recently, now that we've been um, kind of getting the word out a little bit more, there's been people that have, you know, sent me things to read and things like that, um, which is really, you know, it's flattering. Um, but I mean, to this point, like, 
ideas, there'll just be things that, I mean, you'll just see things on the street or um, a lot of times you get story ideas just being on BART and just kind of ear hustling people's conversations and listening <laughs> to what people are saying. Um, so it, it comes from everywhere. The, the, the big thing is there's a lot of ideas that you get, but how to tie them into being one idea and making a, a concise story about, you know, mm -hmm. with it. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of ideas, but you know, how can you tell a story for two hours or for Being able to complete it, bring it exactly. from here to here with completion. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can start out and you just, you know, gung ho and exactly. you get halfway through and it's yeah. like, okay, well, where do I go from here? Yeah, I so mean. So to keep that inspiration through it. It's really important. Uh, I think, like, especially if you write a lot, I mean, um, I know myself is, for example, like, you know, writing a feature is really easy a lot of times to write your first act. Uh, and then even even sometimes your third act, but that middle portion, the second act, is always is really difficult. It's when you really see how far your idea, you mm -hmm. know, can be stretched or not, and, and how much you need to refine it more. So, okay. Well, I know uh, our guest panelist Lisa um, has a questionnaire in the audience for you. Lisa, what you got for us? Yeah. Oh, Shay. Um, <laughs> So great to meet you. Um, I was just curious because I'm always uh, just really inspired and fascinated by, you know, uh, especially filmmakers as artists working with such small budgets. Yeah. Um, and the, the interview last night of Joss Wheaton on uh, Colbert, and he was talking about the micro budget well, film. Yeah, right. And I mean, here's somebody who can do features with huge budgets, but he shot uh, his news feature, Romeo and Juliet, uh, in his house. And he, he talked about doing the micro budget. and. I just want to know your feeling about that, and and does does working with a smaller budget really um, give you more license in terms of an artistic um, openness and a way to play with some things that normally you can't? And how do you, you know, any reflections about that? I hope not, because I, <laughs> I want to do that ten million. <laughs> but um, still have creative control. Yeah, for real. Um, but no, I mean, I've, you know, I think that's been the trend. Um, you know, John Reedon is one of those guys. Um, there's been other people, um, uh, Derek C. and Prince, who recently made uh, Blue Valentine, which is like a huge favorite movie of mine. Um, there's a lot of filmmakers that have almost put a limit on themselves uh, in terms of budget because, you know, a lot of times having a restriction, it, it, it forces you in ways to be more creative because you have a lot of obstacles that you have to, you know, kind of work around. Mm -hmm. So I think it could be kind of liberating sometimes to maybe take less of a budget and I definitely when you you know you're talking about a guy like Josh Whedon um, you know the less the budget is I'm sure the less the pressure and the less expectation you know you have from certain executives and things like that so you have more freedom so I, I definitely think it can be liberating to have to work with less. So. Um, I, I often work in theater and sometimes okay. if you don't have the large space or the lighting or the budget for the props you know, you come up with some yeah, exactly. alternatives, and that can really, you know, open up something and, you know, give your talent um, some parameters in which to explore other options. I think Absolutely. that's um, very interesting. Yeah, and and just for both of the filmmakers um, on our panel, um, just I was just curious too, with you know, so much of the advent of people creating their own content, putting it on YouTube, um, putting out their reality TV, and even scripted television that ju that's really reflecting more of you know, kind of real America, I think of Breaking Bad and, and, mm -hmm. and shows like that that's, you know, less of the glamorous <laughs> Hollywood type of trend. Um, how do you feel like that that kind of fits into the independent filmmaker scene or it does it even? Yeah. You want to start? <laughs> sure. I, so theory in the experimental film is always about um, it's, it's, it should be in your hands. Like, you should be able to tell your own story. Like, with Hollywood, the way it's traditionally told is, you know, you get a, a, a glamorous actress. You make them look glamorous. You pay a lot of money. You, it's, it, it's, the people watching it don't look like them. They don't, they're not uh, reflective of people. So in, in experimental, the theory is you, you can make the films you want. It can be the way you want it. Um, you may not have the same audience. You may not have the same budget. But, you know, what do you call art now? Like, is it, is it something you craft? Is it something you have to be judged on? And I think it's something you express, something that you feel mm. and you want to express that way. I feel that artists aren't ever going to be satisfied with a regular day job. That's why even as me, I, I have a day job, but I can't survive um, doing independent film 
So I do need a day job, but I won't be satisfied with just the day job. So I need that outlet. Mm -hmm. So even if I don't go that far with it, at least I have that uh, outlet to create something and, and go somewhere. Express and I, yeah, and I think YouTube is a great source for people to do that, or at least learn from it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll learn to, to perform, to like how it look, and then maybe they'll make adjustments from that. So it becomes more con conscious now. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you can craft things around that. So it just takes um, your idea, and then you build from there. And it's, it's yeah. definitely an avenue where people are becoming extremely successful. Yeah. You know, you would have never thought that you two would be creating the next stars. Right. You know, people mm -hmm. having their own shows and then getting guest appearances on, you know. That's true, yeah. I know that there's, right um, the TV, yeah, you know. yeah. I know there's like YouTube stars, so then it's kind of. These are endless at this yeah. point. So when you think about it, you're like, oh, you know, I, you, would, you never, like, you're like, I, I might know that person, but you don't know where. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's the internet, internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah. yeah, yeah, that's I true. I would even add, too, I mean, just thinking back to your question as well, it's just like, um, you know, I think Jason's spot on. I would add that, um, you know, I think that audiences are just starting to want to watch different types of content. I mean, you talk about a show like The Walking Dead, which is basically for the past you know year or two has been the number one show in terms of ratings. Um, you know, I think people are just getting to a point where they want to watch different things, and I think I, even things like Netflix and mm -hmm. the the amount of Asian and European cinema that's been opened up mm -hmm. to people on their laptops and on their cell phones, they have this whole different whole different type of, of storytelling to watch now that's so different from what we've. You know, had in the United States. So. exposed to exactly. Yeah. So I think I think the content um, getting darker, things like Breaking Bad. Um, I think it's it's just a reflection of maybe the audience changing and you know the taste just kind of changing with time. So kind of the market following the the, the audience. Thing. Absolutely. Right. Lisa, did you have a uh, uh, well? Question I would love to uh, see if our audience here in the studio has any questions or comments for either of our filmmakers. Any thoughts? I know some of you guys work in film and might have some reflections on some of their comments. Any, any questions? I'm sure. Yeah. I'm just wondering uh, what kind of methods of distribution Shay has been trying to use. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. How do you get your stuff out there? That's a big one. It, to me, it's um, I've I've really just been noticing that a lot of people have been having success with social networks, mm -hmm. um, and it's really important because um, we, for, for my project, for example. We tried to raise funds with uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter for the professor. And um, I really noticed that a lot of the, the successful projects, they had a lot of uh, friends and family, um, you know, really pulling hard for uh, the project and, and just getting out there word of mouth. So I think um, social networking and being able to, to really manipulate Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and things like that is, is really, really going to be important for filmmakers going forward. That's great. Anybody else with any thoughts or comments? Okay. Now, now Shay, right. uh, let me ask you this. I know uh, filmmakers. It's um, like I've kind of, kind of dabbled in doing like my own little shorts here and there. You know, yep. putting stuff on YouTube. And I noticed that the community is really about sharing techniques and sharing, you know, ideas and collaboration. It's not like so cutthroat with other businesses yeah. and, and kind of art, art you know, mediums that, that are out there mm. where people don't want to, you know, they feel like they're in competition yeah. with each other. It's more open. Um, what can you say about that? I think uh, there's a lot of, like, maybe resources and skills different people have. Like, for me, I'm not really a strong audio person. Like, I can, you know, create a shot list. I can t t tell the story, but, you know, as far as the frequencies that I want to get, as far as, like, you know, ranges and things like that, other people have experience in that, and I can learn it probably, but I feel like it's not the best thing to do. So if someone's really interested in doing something like that, then um, it would be great to have them part of the team. And then even them, they'll like have ideas. So then you're like, oh, I never thought of that. So mm -hmm. then that's when the collabor collaboration process becomes, uh, like you said, organic. Mm -hmm. It just keeps growing from there. Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, the skills themselves maybe is very, uh, very practical like you know if you work in audio at a job then maybe it's just to um, turn on the mic that's mm -hmm. it but then if you have all these other skills along with it then now you're contributing to a, a work that that a team put together mm -hmm. yeah nice and, and show you what we, yeah I mean sign? I think yeah I think Jason's uh, right uh, and a lot of the saying I think um, filmmakers just in general um, 
I think we're just maybe a collaborative, um, especially when we get around other people that are like-minded. Um, and I mean, it's yeah, it's staggering. Like the type of stuff that you can learn on YouTube for, you know, After Effects or mm -hmm. for Final Cut, whatever it is, it's almost like a school. Mm -hmm. You know, the type of techniques and things that people are willing to share. Um, so I think it's I think it's visually it's leveling the playing field, um, which I think is good. And I I, I think it's also putting um, a new emphasis on writing and acting, mm -hmm. which might not have you know maybe been there before. Um, now the technology is starting to level the playing field. I think those. Those two aspects definitely, you know, those are the, the new things to, to focus on. So, mm -hmm. now if uh, if I was an aspiring filmmaker, where what would you what advice would you give to someone who's just starting? You know, says I, you know, just watched a brand new Superman and they're like, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to be a part of this. I want to <laughs> I want to do this. You know, what 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 do they where do they start? Like how how do they figure out if that you know if it's something they're gonna do or you know. Worth pursuing. Yeah, I, would, you tell I would just say, I, I would really say, just like don't wait. You know what I mean? Like if it's something that you want to do, just just try to do it. Even if you have to use an iPhone or you mm -hmm. know what I mean, whatever. Just try to tell the story. I mean, don't worry so much initially about the technology. Just just do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the you know how much money you have. Get some friends. You know, get something that you think is a solid script and some actors and do it. So mm -hmm. just kind of keep moving forward and it all kind of come together because yeah. you do like you said there's people with different skills and you just kind of come together everybody kind of stay in their lane and bring it all together well yeah I, I know for myself like i know and like initially um maybe especially for like a, a writer or a director because a lot of times like that's that's one of those positions on a on a film crew where everyone is kind of looking to you um so you don't always have that that you know uh, assistant or that that person to share the responsibilities with so sometimes it can be really intimidating so I would just say you know really get over your <coughs> intimidation and um, just just go out and just try to do something you know what I mean because and communication yeah and communication I mean you have to filmmaking is to me at least in my experience so far is one of those things you can go to school you can read all those books it's something you really have to do and you have to do it consistently so because a lot you of you, you learn you, you you'd be so surprised like how much you learn just looking at your own dailies and looking at things that you you shot and so do they fit in whatever you're trying to edit and you learn so much by doing it so just do it that would be my advice so just do just it just do it <laughs> just do it I've that somewhere before yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's catchy I keep practicing yeah, yeah. nice now uh, who are if you had to name three three filmmakers that inspired you the most who would you Sarah the, the three filmmakers that you watch you study those are the people that you kind of gravitate towards. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I man, that's <laughs> put me on the spot. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> tell me. Let's see. Um, I know a big inspiration, definitely in writing this uh, web series, uh, has been Rod Serling, mm -hmm. um, uh, who worked on the original Twilight Zone and Planet of the Apes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, I think he was just really ahead of his time mm -hmm. for the time period that he was writing in and. Um, just you know, watching some of the old uh, Twilight Zone episodes is just crazy. Some of the things that he was hitting on, in terms of racism and uh, sociology, and just contemporary America at the time. You know what I mean? Um, uh, definitely uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino. I think everybody who's into film has some sort of um, influence um, through him. And um, I definitely, um, I say Alfonso Cuarón is definitely a favorite of mine. Um, so yeah, those guys are those guys are, are great to me. So, mm -hmm. well, what about what about you, Jason? Uh, I really like Michelle Gondry a lot. He did uh, Eternal Sun Sunshine of the Spotless oh, Mind. Yeah, he's he's very yeah he's very um, his visual sense is very unique mm -hmm. and I it's really playful and I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, so his work is great. Uh, a classic is Hitchcock. I think he he's really great at suspense. He just sets it up very. Masterfully, and, and one thing that's funny about him, he's um, he prepared so much that he didn't have to worry about how the shot looked or the editing because he only shot exactly what he wanted, yeah. so they didn't have any options. So he really just crafted it exactly the way he wanted. Nice. I'm not sure if that's the best way to do film, but it because it's a really a collaborative process. You know, you're working with a lot of people, mm -hmm. and if you're just your way all the time, you know, fle no flexibility, you're gonna there's gonna be a lot of strain on the crew and everything. Right. But uh, but he's just he was just able to get away with it. He was really good. But then uh, I like John Woo a lot too. He's a great action director. Mm -hmm. 
And I, th I think a lot of people might think it's easy, just action, like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're running or mm -hmm. you're explosion. But I think it, it, it's a certain tempo, it's a certain setup. To dance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you have, and so when it's done right, you feel it. You, you're, you're in the moment. If you, just see, if you just see an action scene happen, mm -hmm. it may not, it could be done different ways, but I think he does it very, uh, uh, very visually. On the spot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He hits all the marks. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, we're also joined here by another guest, uh, Sonny B. Allen, who's a esteemed author. Um, Sonny, why don't you go and tell us a little about yourself? Okay, my name is Sonny B. Allen. I live here in the East Bay in Walnut Creek. For the first 30 years of my life, I was a public administrator in Santa Clara County. I retired a few years ago, and something I always wanted to do was to write a book. The inspiration for this particular book, Silicon Valley Hookup, goes back a long way. When I was a much younger man, I wouldn't emphasize much younger, <laughs> I had a real penchant for British sports cars, Triumphs, MGs, and cars like that. The only problem is, in those days, those cars were constantly breaking down. Mm. I would find myself being towed from one place to another at midnight by a tow truck driver, or uh, from one place to another uh, to school, whatever the case might be. So what I discovered uh, in the course of having these experiences is that I got to know a lot of tow truck drivers, unfortunately. <laughs> <you know? laughs> And what I've discovered, these are very interesting individuals. For example, I met one guy who was a member of the French Foreign Legion until he was wow. kicked out of the country, <laughs> and he moved to California. Mm. I met another guy, for example, who was filthy rich, he was from England, his family kicked him out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> but the bottom line was, I think, like, like a lot of people, I had a kind of a stereotypic image of what these folks were. I thought they were just blue collar types, probably not very interesting, which is totally wrong. Mm. So over a period of years, I thought to myself, somebody should write a book about some of the stories these guys have shared with me over the last somebody five or six like years. <laughs> somebody being me. <laughs> <laughs> so when I retired from uh, my profession in 2007, uh, I start to write, you know, and as you know, writing requires a lot of discipline, which I didn't have at the time. Mm. And uh, I would write something for about a month and I'll quit. Mm. I'd write for two more months and I'll quit. Finally, two years ago, I got real serious. My wife is here, she can tell you this. <laughs> for the last two years, I've been at the computer almost every day trying to finish this book. Mm -hmm. And I finally finished it about a month and a half ago. So Silicon Valley hookup is about what I call the other Silicon Valley. Is Silicon Valley comprised of people who are, quote, everyday people who are not necessarily in the technology business. Now this character, Lance Murray, who is the lead character in the book, he's like me, a California baby boomer. Uh, he's someone who's trying to find his way in life. In other words, he's been through a couple of marriages, he's been divorced twice, he went to Iraq and came back and still haven't quite found what he wants to do. So he found a job as a tow truck driver in Santa Clara County. So for the past 15 years, that's what he's been doing. This book is about the various characters and challenges that he experienced that 15 years. He has met some crazy people, okay? So each chapter introduces you to a different circumstance he encountered. For example, uh, the feedback I've gotten so far from people who read the book is that one of the characters they really love is a woman by the name of Justine. Justine is a 5 foot 10, 175, 175 pound redhead from San Diego who's a former kickboxing champion who don't take any crap from anybody. <laughs> okay, she is one of the few tow truck drivers that work with uh, the, the lead character Lance mm -hmm. Murray. Another character is a woman by the name of Mother Marcel. Mother Marcel is a New Orleans voodoo priestess who lives in the Montclair district of Oakland. She makes a living by casting spells on friends and enemies alike. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 it, it, it's 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 a compilation of those kinds of stories. Uh, another good story, in my view. Uh, Christmas Eve. 11.30 at night. He gets a call from a Denny's in Fremont. He, he tows the guy's Range Rover. The guy jumps in the truck. They drive him down 880, and what looked like a large animal just runs across the freeway like a big dog or something. He wasn't sure what it was, so Lance just slammed the brakes on and go, who the hell was that? He gets out of his truck, and the thing was gone. Whatever, the, it was gone. He gets back in the truck, and his custom was gone. Oh. He looked in the rear view mirror, and the Range Rover was gone. <laughs> oh, wow. So he discovered later that the person who he thought was a human in the truck was really something else, which I'm not going to tell you. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of Twilight Zone, I'm old enough to remember those Sunday night yeah. shows. Yeah. Yeah. I, remember they, they were, I was fascinated in myself by those, uh, by, oh. by Rod Sterling. He was always ahead of his time. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so the book is a compilation of those kinds of stories. They're short, bite-sized chapters that at some point all sort of coalesce together. 
And it took you how long? Two, two years. From the time? Okay. Yeah, but two years. this all started years ago. This started for back you. in the late 1970s. So this was about yeah. just sitting it, you know, there waiting. Yeah. And I said, I got to do this, you know. So uh, the last two years, I've been home every day trying to type something up. And it's been a heck of a challenge, so believe congratulations, me. Congratulations. It's not easy. It's yeah. not easy. Congratulations. But again, you know, I'm, ha I'm happy it's over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, moved, I've, I've moved on to the you second project. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, let me ask you, uh, is the character, is this based on one particular character and seeing uh, different scenes through their eyes? Or is this uh, like you're meeting various different characters? This one character takes you on a ride in his truck for the past 15 years, where he all meet the all these he different people. Across. Yeah, yeah. And, across and, and, and the good thing about it, uh, he finally finds happiness with the woman. Uh, he finally finds his soulmate. I'm telling you too much already. <laughs> 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 I know. But the book is really about how you can start at one point in life and end up in a much better place if you're not sure where you want to go. And that's kind of where he was, because he, he's like a lot of people. You know, you're not quite sure what you want to do or what your circumstances are, but you know you want to improve, but you're not quite sure what the roadmap is to making those things happen and meeting that right person, if you will. Mm -hmm. It happens to him through the 50 years of driving along the freeway. So he, uh, he's an interesting guy. Sounds like an awesome story. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you have any uh, questions on the audience that we could possibly? Yeah, actually, and I have a question for you, Sonny. First, I want to say congratulations on completing this book. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, you've, you've touched a little bit about this writing process, which is really difficult and takes a lot of discipline. Right. Uh, I myself have, uh, in the past, tried to write something, and I, I'm one of those people who've put it aside, and mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's half done, and you kind of yeah. stall and stall and stall. Um, what advice do you have for people who are in that position where they want to get their thing out and uh, even if it's you know like for our filmmakers whether you want to get that film made or write that musical score or write that book um how did you find that discipline in that place to finally get the the push to make I it happen think one word comes to mind persistence you know you have to want to actually do this because years ago i thought i wanted to do this but as soon as i was typing for a week or two i said i don't want to do this you know <laughs> but you get to a point where you decide you got to do this and i think what you do is develop some good habits for example every morning from 10 to 12 i write every afternoon from 2 to 4 i write it's like getting up going to work every day you know you, you turn off the tv you go to the computer you know what you want to say and you just put it down but again discipline persistence and having some kind of vision of what you want at the end of the road if you will Advice. That, that sounds like good <laughs> advice. Um, I'd love to open up to our audience if anyone has questions. Yeah, for, yeah. So, Questions for our author, Sonny. Anybody? Writing a book is a huge achievement, I have to say. It, it <laughs> it's really very impressive. Is. It, it really is. It was much Comments? Of I have a sure. Uh, so y this was your first book, and it sounds to me like... Um, you might be self-publishing and self-distributing as well. Uh, how is that Self-publishing for sure. And distribution. How, how is it going? It's going great. Wow. It's going great. W what I've done is that I did a lot of things beforehand. In other words, people knew I was trying to do that, trying to do this. So I talked to various people over the last year or so. Uh, I've done some research online in terms of uh, avenues where I can uh, promote the book, like what I'm doing here, for example. And I always did some social networking, all that kind of stuff happens. But creating a buzz is what we're going through right now. But uh, People like it. In other words, I got some responses a couple of days ago. I was in Napa, and the lady said, I really like your book. She said, at first I wasn't quite sure what the title she said, but the more I read it, I read it rather, the more it made sense, you know. And that's, I think, it's kind of like the appeal right. of the book itself. The, the title could be a little misleading. In fact, in fact yeah, yeah, exactly. I thought she was out there no hooking up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that's an interesting point. Think, <laughs> think about this. Okay, think front, about so. this. A couple different. It takes place in Silicon Valley. And hook up is a play on words. It can mean hook up, true. like with a lady or whatever right. your preference is. Or it can mean literally hooking up to the vehicle itself, yeah. which is also true. So it's an honest book. So it's, <laughs> it's honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's double yes. meaning. Yes. Yeah. Um, another thought that occurred to me when I was listening to your story is um, kind of like the sort of a little bit of a social commentary on, you know, as we go about our daily lives and we meet, you know, p people who work in stores and, you know, people in service industry. And you think, you know, here's a person, they're wearing a name tag, they're yeah. doing their job, they're at Starbucks, whatever. Exactly. But, you know, behind that person is somebody with a story and, a, and often a very interesting person. That's so the point. So do you think like maybe a takeaway for readers for your book is I that they're going to they're gonna look at those people in their lives maybe a little differently from now on? There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think I, like many, uh, looked at the people I met 
at that point in a certain type of way. We have these uh, parameters in which we judge people, if you will. Right. And uh, you realize you're usually wrong. People are far more complex than that. They're much more nuanced than that. So it's best not to draw any conclusions, just observe and listen. And I finally got smart enough to realize that as I start to meet these folks in these trucks, you know, over a period of I don't know how many years. But uh, that's a good point. And I think it's a lifelong lesson, actually, uh, you should do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions from our audience today? OK, for the lady in front who uh, I believe happens to wife, be yeah. married <laughs> to the author. Yeah. So we're going to let her talk. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> OK, so who is your favorite character in the book and why? Oh, Great question. Mother Marcel. Mother Marcel is a character that appeals to a lot of people. And she also she scares people, too. This woman is about 85 years old. She's originally from Louisiana. Uh, she learned how voodoo methods from her mother, who was also a voodoo priestess. Uh, when she moved to California 50 years later, uh, she started to practice those same rituals here in the Bay Area. And she got a reputation as being someone who can solve problems for you that no one else can. Mm -hmm. For example, Ooh. there was a politician who went to her, and he wanted to be mayor of San Francisco. And the guy he was running against was very powerful, and he was very connected. And the guy who wanted to be mayor had no experience, but he was just well-liked by the community. He went to Mother Marcel. She told him to bring her six dried black roses, a day-old cup of coffee, and fish scales. When he went to see her, she had made some type of concoction for him to drink. Oh. And this was a week before he was supposed to go on TV to actually uh, uh, debate his opponent, who he had no chance of beating, supposedly. She also gave him an envelope with some silver grape powder. She told him, before you go on TV to debate this guy, make sure you put this powder somewhere near his body. The day in the, the, day in the studio, <laughs> in, in the studio, this was in the studio, before they were in the air, his opponent, who was a real arrogant you-know-what, got up, put his jacket down, got up, went to the bathroom. Mother Marcel's customer took the powder, put it around the collar of his shirt, uh, his, his jacket. And lights went on like this and started talking. And he couldn't remember his name. He started throwing up, and he lost his bowels on live TV. Oh, oh, Needless to say, he lost the election. <laughs> and Mother Marcel, like a real person. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you go see her? Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah. but, but but she's a character that a lot of people find interesting. I, I ran into a woman the other day in Napa, and she said, "I read your book." She said, "But that Mother Marcel scares me." Mm. You know, I said, "Well." She's not bad if she likes you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. 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 So, so there are characters like that in the book. And each of these people, uh, my lead character, he, he meets these folks over the, uh, over the years. And what you're getting is a journey with him as he meets these people and the kind of experiences that he has. And so how many chapters is this? 18. OK, yeah. and so there are 18 different? Is 18 different? 18, 18 different chapters, but at some point, some of the characters kind of come together at some point. So they intertwine. They intertwine, exactly, exactly. Now let me ask you from a business perspective, uh, when you're promoting the book and you're doing a tour, you're putting it together with the, with the smaller uh, bookshops, right? Uh, is it mom and pop. Yeah. Is Actually, I'm really not focusing on mom and pop because I think the reality is that the platform for any new it's publisher is uh, Amazon. In fact, Amazon. That, that's, uh, Amazon has a publishing arm called Create Space, and that's who mm -hmm. I'm did this okay. with, you know. Okay. And uh, they have the, I have nothing against the mom and pop books, but in a mom and pop store, they, may, they may or may not take your book, put it on a shelf for maybe a month, you put five books there, you come back a month later, nothing mm -hmm. is sold because no one knows the book is there. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine going into a store with thousands of books, unless you know specifically what you're looking for, you may browse a little bit, but you're probably not going to get nothing else but other than what you want. With the Amazon platform, literally millions of people can see your book, expose to your book with the right situation. Mm -hmm. So that's the way things are going. Business-wise, mom and pop stores are just dying all over the country yeah. because they can't compete. You remember we had a bookstore, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it. One of the chains in the last few years, one of the big bookstore chains. Borders. Uh, Borders, yeah. right, yeah. okay. Yeah. They went under. You know, and one of the reasons they went on is because of the online Technology, sales. Yeah. yeah, and the same thing is going to happen to others unless they're smart enough to develop some type of marketing effort to attract people the same way Amazon does in terms of pricing, variety, all that type of thing. Now, if someone has a Kindle, can they 
Can they find your content online? Yes, you can go to Amazon.com. You can download this on your Kindle for two ninety nine, very reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. You know, or you can buy, or you can buy this for ten dollars. And I only did it for you guys. Oh. <laughs> Hooking up. <laughs> Hooking up. <laughs> Hooking up. Take another project I'm working on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have another book. I'm about thirty percent done. This book is called Kiss by the Sun. It takes place in 1938 in the Deep South. It's about a family of five girls. One of the girls is murdered. Mm. The youngest sister is never told about her older sister murder. So the next scene is 1985 in LA. The baby girl is celebrating with all her four siblings at Christmas time in Southern California in LA. And she overhears a conversation about her sister who she was told died of typhoid but had really been murdered by a man in their town. Mm -hmm. So the story is about basically her trying to find out how did it happen, why was the man brought to justice, and that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. So find out those skeletons, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the basic premise. It's really a, a story of trying to get justice. And that mm -hmm. one is Kissed by the Sun. Now? Yeah. Or? I'm about thirty percent okay. done. So with, with a little luck I think by the early early part of the year, maybe early spring. Nice, nice. Yeah. And where can they find your book on Amazon? On Amazon, you can just type in Silicon Valley Hookup. You Silicon can Valley Hookup. Silicon Valley Hookup. Hookup. Don't forget this book, folks. It's a good book, and you I promise you that. Any, feed, any feedback would be appreciated also. Nice. So uh, again, the download is two ninety nine, and the paperback copy is $10. And I just have another question. I wanted to ask everybody, as far as your projects that you're working on now and future projects, like where do you see yourself in the next five years? Where do you see your company going? And, and you know, where, where do you want to be? Where, where do you see this going? Let's start with Shay. Oh, man. Let's start with Shay. <laughs> um, be quiet over there know, for a uh, minute. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. Um, I mean, what is your ultimate? If you were there right now, wherever there is, what would that be? Yeah, what does it look like? Um, I guess just to have the ability to to wake up with an idea and to be able to maybe find the money to be able to do it mm -hmm. and not sacrifice, you know, um, what the idea really is. I guess that would be, you know, I think that would be the real measure of if, if, if you made it or not as a filmmaker, is if, if you have the resources around you, or at least the access to resources to be able to get whatever your project is made, so. Mm -hmm. I, I had an arbitrary goal as an independent filmmaker. T if I made enough shorts to add up to 30 minutes, I would work on a feature. And I'm about like 25 minutes in, so nice. it's almost the next step. Right, right. So, like, where do you go from there? Yeah, so yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a process in that way. You practice by taking on projects, and then you, you accumulate the skills in different projects, and then you move on to do a bigger project, so a feature, and then and then I think that gives you a little bit more. Um, you, you could market it in a different way. A short would be YouTube, maybe, or mm -hmm. like you know you show it to people. But a feature would be a movie, so mm -hmm. people would have to commit to it. Mm -hmm. And how do you get them to do that? Well, you, hopefully your story is really well done, mm -hmm. and, you, and you do that. So that would be my. That's where I want to do that. Um, hopefully within those five years, and then from there be a commercial filmmaker where I could tell those stories, but having the background that I have with you know community and like um, diversity and, and use those perspectives to influence the movies I make so that way those conscious choices are, are available for people to view as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Hey, well my goal is fairly simple, just to sell more books. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all, in all honesty, um, uh, I did this not because of commercial reasons, because I enjoy the writing process. Uh, when you think about it, when I'm dead and gone, this will still be here, mm -hmm. you see. So that's kind of my so focus. It's exactly, exactly. So that's pretty much it for me. Now, if I make some bucks on the side, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's Won't not hurt. No. Like. And Shay, I know we did. Did we get your information on where people can find you and your projects that are going on? Yeah. The website. Information yeah. To yeah um, Shayflix.com. Um, I have uh, all my work, recent stuff up there. Um, the web series, we haven't released it yet. Um, it's still going through post right now, but we have like the, the teaser and some other things up, so you can check everything out there. Nice, nice. Any shout outs? Any, any, any you got a, a crew that you work with? Uh, um, you want to give anybody a something, <laughs> something, mom? What's up, mom? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> nah, um, I would uh, definitely like to just say, um, uh, give a shout out to my cast. 
because it's been, you know, it's been really tough so far. We've been working on this. Um, like, we had auditions last year, so we've been working on it just piece by piece as we've been getting money. And they've been really sticking with me, even though, you know, some of the crew, you know, it's just been kind of different. Series. Right, right, that's the web series. The cast, um, definitely give a shout out to them. Yes. I really appreciate what they've been doing, so. Awesome. Well, I think that about wraps it up for uh, this episode. Uh, once again, the book is Silicon Valley Hooked Up. Uh, you want to definitely check that out on Amazon.com. Um, Shayfilms.com. Right? Shayflix. Oh, Shayflix. F L I X. Yeah. Okay. And Jason again. Yeah, Revelcade.com. Revelcade.com. So we want to thank you guys, everyone, for coming out. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having your talent and all your information. And yeah, the studio audience. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Lisa, is there anything you wanted to say before we? I just want to say uh, to Sonny and Jason and Shay, it was great to meet you and thanks for coming to talk thanks with us. Audience. And definitely a thanks to our studio audience and thanks yeah. for your contributions That's and questions. Thank All you. right, it's, it's been a, a great first episode. Great. 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 <laughs>